friends good afternoon it is indeed a special privilege for me to be with you all i didn't realize what i was getting into carl told me that we have a meeting this afternoon and he gave me a little background on what we are going to do yesterday so i come in here park and i said are you sure we are at the right place but i am so happy to see you all i am amazed at what you young people are doing in india today i am so proud of you i met someone who is working on tribal people met another one working on kanun meet lot of you who are really very interested in building new india when i see some of you i feel so excited about the future of india my journey has been a long one i was born in 1942 i'm 75 years old and those were the early days of india's independence growing up to us mahatma gandhi nehru patel maulana azad subhas chandra bose were the real idols in our mind we grew up with gandhian thought inclusion truth trust self reliance simplicity sacrifice courage all of these words meant so much to us as little kids my father had fourth grade education but in our house we had five big photographs that big of these five leaders and their idea of india was the key in our mind while we were going through schools and colleges i went to us in 1964 and as i learned little bit there in 60s i realized that there are three fundamental issues in india disparity demography and development and i also realized that to really overcome these first we need connectivity in 1980 79 i came to delhi and could make a phone call to my wife in chicago this was from five star hotel so little bit of arrogance and lot of ignorance said i'm going to fix this damn thing and i spent next 10 years of my life trying to fix india's phones rajiv gandhi gave me the political will and i felt without connectivity there is no start then we had 2 million telephones it used to take 15 years to get a telephone connection you may not know but your grandfather would know your father also may not know and today we have 1.2 billion phones we are a connected country of billion the key question is what do you do with this connectivity second challenge was knowledge and to bring knowledge in open domain you need to use this connectivity and democratize information so we started with knowledge commission right to information right to knowledge all of these things didn't mean much to people we were working with they had no idea of what is that we were talking about i remember when i started my work in telephones there were so many critical front page stories in india saying why are these foreign return guys trying to fix india's phones when you need to worry about food agriculture 
And my answer to them was, I don't know how to fix agriculture, find somebody else. I know how to do my job. I can try to fix phones, I don't guarantee I'll be able to do it. But every little thing in India matters. You do what you know how to do best, somebody else knows something else, and we all add little drop here, little drop there, and then hopefully it adds up. All the things that we dreamt of many years ago, you are really making it happen. Without your support, all of our work will be lost. Nobody will even understand. To me, open government is the key. Open data is the foundation. So when Obama came here, he and I spent half an hour, and I tried to explain to him what we are doing in India by putting more fiber to connect rural India. We connected him to Rajasthan. And when I explained to him the kind of platforms we are trying to build, connectivity platform, GIS, UID, data centers, cybersecurity, applications, he was amazed. He said, Sam, how do you all think about things like this? And my answer to him was, if we don't think like this, we cannot build new India. It is very difficult to build new India with old tools. The only hope we have is to use new tools and our younger talent. I am firm believer in young talent in India. When I started CDOT in 1984, average age of the organization was 23. They were the brightest kids, hardworking, sincere, honest, committed, courageous, dedicated, nationalist, and they made things happen. People used to say, why are you hiring only young? I said, because they are fresh, they are full of energy, enthusiasm, and they are not corrupt mentally. We have lots of problems in India, but we have lots of challenges. So when people tell me about problems in India, I tell them, you don't need talent to identify problems in India. Nor do you need talent to identify solutions in India. You really need courageous people who are willing to give something to go back and do something for the people of India. We have a long way to go. There is work cut out for the next 50 years. For the last 40 years, I have been saying, best brains in the world are busy solving problems of the rich, who really don't have problems to solve. And as a result, problems of the poor don't get the right kind of talent. India is the only country where you will find talent comparable to anywhere else in the world that would have some feelings to solve the problems of the poor. India is the only country where you will find solutions to lift 400 million below poverty line. And then that solution can be applied to other parts of the world. We are a land of contrast. Anything I can say about India, you can say exactly opposite. And you are 100% right. And that is the beauty of India. Diversity is a fertile ground for innovations. And we are the most diverse country in the world. You go to Northeast, they don't look like so-called Indian. I remember once I was in Mexico and I was looking for Indian ambassador. I was a keynote speaker with 500 people and somebody said, Indian ambassador is coming. So I went to receive him and I couldn't find him. Finally, I said, where is he? The guy said, oh, he was waiting for you. He's sitting in the front row. I go and he looks like Chinese because he's from Northeast. And even with my background, I sort of assume that if he's an Indian ambassador, he should look like me. That is the beauty of India. India has so much to celebrate. 
but I worry at times when I look at the India of today. When people try to curb information, when people spread lies on social media, attack freedom, it bothers me. And that's where you all come in. You have to really preserve this turf, at least in the cyberspace, for development for everybody. No untouchability, no differences, doesn't matter program is Harijan or Brahmin or Hindu or Muslim, doesn't, we don't care. We are inclusive in every way possible. Information is for everybody. Today the kind of discussion that goes on in India is so very petty. We really need to raise the level of conversation in India. I am doing a book right now. I did a book on my life a few years ago. And I did that for my granddaughter. Because my granddaughter, who is now six, lives in San Francisco, someday going to grow up and ask, who was this old man who came to America 100 years ago, 75 years ago? And whatever her father, who is born and raised in US, tells her is going to be very different because her father has no idea of the kind of poverty I came from. He cannot even comprehend that I was born in a small little tribal village in India where my mother delivered eight kids all at home. No doctor, no nurse, no hospital, no pharmacy, nothing. No schools. And even if I tell them this, they think dad is making it up. This cannot be reality. It is that India we have to change. If we don't use technology to lift 400 million below poverty line to something respectable, we haven't done our job. We don't want to build an India where there are more billionaires. If they are, more power to them. I have nothing against them. But I want to use technology to transform everything in India. And that can only come from knowledge that can only come from people like you, that can only come from openness. To me, information bring about, brings about openness, access, accountability, network, democratization, decentralization. All of these things are Gandhian. If Gandhi was to arrive today, he would be so happy to meet you. I'm giving a talk day after tomorrow at Gandhi Ashram. This is, in fact, Carl and I spent last year, October 2nd, at Gandhi Ashram. And we tried to really focus on spreading Gandhi's ideas in the information age and tell people the connectivity how Gandhi is more relevant today than ever before in the history of mankind. So I lost track earlier while I was telling you about the second book. I'm writing a book on redesigning the world. The world that we have designed today is completely obsolete. The last design was by, world, by US after World War II. UN, World Bank, NATO, IMF, GDP, GNP, per capita income, balance of payment, democracy, human rights, capitalism, consumption, and wars. All of these things don't make sense anymore. GDP don't mean a damn thing, but we still follow it. All of the measurements today can benefit from big data, cloud computing, analytics. Then it was not possible. So you said gross GDP, and everybody agreed. Today, you can go and zero in on so many little details because you have huge data to analyze. I'm so happy that someone here is taking all the data from the port, putting it on web. I fought for seven years with all our chief justices. Every new chief justice appointed, I will call him next day. 
go to his house, we'll have tea with him and try to convince him that why does it take 15 years to get justice? Why can't we computerize all your courts and get justice in three years? And he would say, yes, Sam, we agree with you, Mr. Petroda. We are all with you. Terrific idea. Let's do it. And then nothing will happen. And in eight months, there will be new chief justice. So I go to him again. And he would say, you are so very right. We are going to do it this time. With all good intentions. They mean well. But they can't do it. Why does it take 15 years to settle a court case in India? With all the expertise you have, it can be done in a year, maybe two, maybe three. So you need to use IT everywhere to transform. You got to transform the very fabric of this society. From homes, to work, to police, to court, to government, to education, to health services, agriculture, and your tools are basically information, information, information. Through information, knowledge, wisdom, action, and courageous young people to go do something. In India, you can write off anybody who is above probably 45, including me. They are just not equipped to handle this world. Everyone in India talks about the past. Nobody talks about future. It's all about Ram, history. Immediately somebody will talk about Hanuman, somebody will talk about some, another god. Or will say, this was our heritage. Nobody talks about future. Our heritage is important. We are proud of our heritage. Our art, our culture, our music. And we are trying to computerize a lot of that. You know, about 15 years ago, we took one million manuscripts and digitized it. Fifteen years ago. Forty years ago, thirty-seven years ago, we started at Indira Gandhi Institute with Kapila Vatsava, storing all our art on microfilm. All of this stuff is now coming to a point where it makes sense. Earlier, we didn't have the right tools. Now, Storage is cheap, just to give an idea. I bought 16-bit RAM for $16. I hope that makes sense to some of you. I bought 4-input NAND gate for $37 each. When first microprocessor was designed at Intel, I was there. All the Intel founders were friends of mine, Bob Noyce, Lester Hogan, Gordon Moore, and first 4-bit processor, I used it for telephony. And we thought that was a miracle. And we thought, my God, what a powerful tool. And look what you have today. You are sitting with gigabits and terabits and so much processing power just in your cell phone. And this is changing India. But it has to change in the way you want it to change, not in the way somebody sitting in U.S. wants it to change. We need local content, local applications, local solutions, Indian version of development, and not Western version of development. It's too bad that everybody wants to be like U.S. That model is not scalable, sustainable, desirable, workable. We need to create Indian model of development, and that's where Gandhi lives. So while I was talking to some young people here, I said, can you get me data set for every district? What I want is for every district, everything should be available online. Court cases, police, teachers, schools, hospitals, doctors. I don't care about Indian database. Of course, it's important. I'm not saying it's not important. But I want work at district level. At district level, if I have need for 500 teachers, I don't need to go to Delhi to ask, where do I go hire? I need to hire them right there. We need to decentralize everything. Today, power in India is in two places. Prime Minister and Chief Minister. I had a meeting this morning with the mayor 
of Bangalore. And I said, look, first thing we should do is give more power to mayor. Mayor has no power in India. Nobody knows who is mayor. They are mayor only for a year. And it's funny, in a year you don't even know where to go to bathroom. You know, you need three, four years to figure out what you are supposed to do. But the reason behind one year is we don't give you time to figure it out. So we can do whatever we are doing and you go cut ribbons. So I told him, let's push to get mayor five-year term. Same thing in district. District head is who? Collector. There is no elected member at a district level. Why can't we have district level developmental model through all the stuff you are doing to really decentralize? I don't want to take too much of your time, but I have lots and lots of ideas that I want to share with you. I want to remain connected with you. I am indeed very proud of what you are doing. I want to be of help. I am obsolete. I know that. I recognize that. I respect that. But I still want to work and be busy. So I start every day at 8 o'clock in the morning and I work till 11, 12 every day, Saturday, Sunday because that's the only thing I know how to do. I have no holidays. I've never taken vacation in 50 years because there is just too much work out there in India. It's better to be busy than go on a beach and have a drink. That don't excite me. And it's good to see so many of you on Sunday afternoon. And I really, really appreciate your coming to Sunday afternoon because this is the only slot I had available. So I told Carl, who is a friend of mine, and Carl is an interesting character. I don't know whether you know Carl, but you should Google Carl. You know, Carl is a very close friend of mine. He and I do all kinds of crazy things. We just launched in uh, San Francisco, along with Booster, this uh, at Internet Archives, where he took 450,000 books from India and put it online. Government of India panicked and said, wait a minute, how can you do that? It's so copyright. We said, don't worry, if they sue us, we'll decide. We'll worry about it. Because government of India is not going to tell us what to read and what not to read. And you need people like that globally to confront the system. Carl and I decided once to take all the Bureau of Indian Standards and put it online. I don't know whether you know Bureau of Indian Standards cost 14,000 rupees in India and 1.4 lakh for foreigner. These are safety standards, fire standards. These are laws and as a citizen you have no access to it. But you are supposed to follow it. It's a funny thing. And when you put it online, government says, oh wait a minute, you can't do it. The answer is tough luck. We are going to do it. And that's the attitude I want you guys to have. I want you guys to have fighter attitude. Don't get sucked into it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Fight it like Gandhi fought. The difference is you are fighting your own cousin. And that fight is tougher. So I wish you all the best. Thank you for giving me this little slot. I look forward to hearing Carl, and then we'll have a broader conversation. I know I was given 15 minutes, maybe I took five more, but where would I get audience like this? Love you. <laughs>